Greetings, we are in Senior English B, and our objective for the hour is to spend some time with two great writers of the Victorian period, Bronte and Harding, who both of them are best known, actually, for the novels that they wrote. But they also were, of course, uh, very, very gifted poets as well. Um, on page 1084, we have an assignment that you are now preparing to write on, a comparative analysis where you are going to look at two writers, Bronte and Hardy, and you're going to look at three poems, one by Bronte, two by Hardy, and you're going to compare and contrast their responses to absence or loss. Okay? And we're going to ask the question, how do the speakers in those poems succeed or fail in dealing with absence and loss, all right? And so as we turn now to the poems themselves, we're going to want to pay attention to that topic. We're going to begin, first of all, with Emily Bronte's uh, little poem uh, called Remembrance. Uh, of course, uh, Bronte is most famous. I'm with you on page 1072, 1073. By the way, before you come in for the examination, uh, you obviously want to make sure that you know the stuff on 1072 in bold under literary analysis. I hope you're looking at it with me now. Obviously, you want to uh, use or employ the reading strategy that's suggested for you on 1072. But most importantly, you want to know those vocab words on 1072. You definitely want to be looking at those vocab words at the bottom of 1072. Go ahead and look at 1073 real quick, and you'll see there, of course, a photograph or a picture of Bronte. You're going to see her dates. You definitely want to write those down. Importantly, you want to make a note at 3A that Bronte is the author of what classic novel? Victorian novel? Do you know? It's right there in the first paragraph on 1073. See, this could end up on the exam. That's why I'm pointing it out to you. Uh, Weathering Heights. Weathering Heights. Now, Bronte had a sister named, uh, na na um, uh, who uh, wrote a novel as well, right? Uh, and she wrote Jane Eyre, okay? So uh, Emily's, Emily's sister is also a very famous uh, writer in her own right as well. All right, let's take a look because we don't have a lot of time, and I want to work through three of these poems, and so for us to do this, we're going to need to... Uh, we're going to need to go kind of quickly. You ought to have about three annotations or sheets of paper. We're going to work with three then poems. The first of the three will be the Emily Bronte uh, poem, Remembrance. I'm with you now reading on 1075 for some background information. Are you ready? Here we go. You're going to put down some notes before we get ready. Background. Victorian poets wrote in many voices and many styles. We've seen this. It's probably the most popular style uh, 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 at 2B, you've seen thus far by Victorian poets. You're, you're right, the dramatic monologue, right? We've seen it quite a bit, haven't we? Some writers like Emily Bronte are classified as romantic because they explore and celebrate the human soul, the wildness of nature, and the powers of the imagination. Thomas Hardy, however, focused on the victimization of ordinary people by social and natural forces. Boy, oh boy, I would write those two things down. Notice what we just said. Bronte oftentimes is associated with what school of writing? Romanticism, good, because she treats powerful emotions. Hardy is interested in what? What was that V word? Victimization of ordinary people by social and natural forces. Do you remember when we were watching our video on the Victorian age and we got to that part about the lower class and the wretched conditions that they live in? That's what, that's what Hardy's concerned about. He doesn't like that stuff, all right? Okay, let's talk about uh, remembrance real quickly. I'll give you a couple of uh, comments to help it for your notes. You can write these down, and this will help you in the terms of writing of the paper as well. First of all, in this poem, remembrance, we are going to have a speaker remembering the one she loves. Okay? Died this is important, 15 years earlier, okay? So been gone for 15 years. The speaker, however, will ask forgiveness because no longer is the speaker remembering as well the passing of the loved one. After 15 years, things are starting to be forgotten go past. You all understand maybe the title of the poem. Now again, 
What are we writing about in our paper from 1084? We're writing on the whole issue of what? Loss. Loss. Correct? That makes sense? We're comparing Bronte to Hardy and these poems, right, in issues of loss. So here we go. We're now going to look at the poem Remembrance. We're just going to read along. we got a professional reader. Pay attention to the question of loss and how it's treated. All right? By Emily Bronte. Cold in the earth, and the deep snow piled above thee, far, far removed, cold in the dreary grave. Have I forgot my only love to love thee, severed at last by time's all-wearing wave? Now, when alone, do my thoughts no longer hover over the mountains on that northern shore, resting their wings where heath and fern leaves cover thy noble heart forever, evermore? Cold in the earth, and fifteen wild Decembers from those brown hills have melted into spring. Faithful indeed is the spirit that remembers after such years of change and suffering. Sweet love of youth, forgive if I forget thee, while the world's tide is bearing me along. Other desires and other hopes beset me, hopes which obscure but cannot do thee wrong. No later light has lightened up my heaven. No second morn has ever shone for me. All my life's bliss from thy dear life was given. All my life's bliss is in the grave with thee. But when the days of golden dreams had perished, and even despair was powerless to destroy, then did I learn how existence could be cherished, strengthened and fed without the aid of joy. Then did I check the tears of useless passion, weaned my young soul from yearning after thine, sternly denied its burning wish to hasten down to that tomb already more than mine. And even yet, I dare not let it languish, dare not indulge in memory's rapturous pain. Once drinking deep of that divinest anguish, how could I seek the empty world again? Now, one of, the, one of the questions that's going to be asked about this poem, and let's answer it in our, in our notes real quickly, is does the speaker of this poem still love the person who died 15 years ago, and how do you know or not know? Can you find specific lines from this poem that tell you whether this person still loves the one that died? Okay, and, and what does it say? Now we alone thoughts no longer hope hover. Right. Now what does that mean? I don't think so much about you anymore. Does that mean that no longer is there love? What do you think? Go ahead, Mr. Diaz. Yeah. Right, right. Let's point it out. In other words, this is the speaker is is kind of working back and forth between powerful emotions. You lose the one you love. Fifteen years have passed. At what point do you get on with your life? And notice in the last stanza, and even yet I dare not let it anguish, dare not indulge in memories, rapturous pain, once drinking deep of that divinest anguish, how could I seek the empty world again? In other words... There's this challenge of how do I actually live, but I have to keep living, and therefore a certain part of me has to let go. So that notion of how you deal with loss, go ahead and write it down. How does this speaker deal with loss? What is the way either success or failure happens to deal with loss? Because that's what we're writing about on 1084 anyway, so let's go ahead and jot it in our notes. All right, let's turn now to Thomas Hardy's poems. And we've got a couple of these, and these are very interesting poems. There are different kinds, but they both are going to emphasize the irony of Hardy. The irony of Hardy. So we're at 2B. When we talk about irony, what are we talking about? Sometimes we'll, we'll uh, talk about this as satire as well. Certainly we're going to see a satiric voice, and for sure the second one 
Um, what, is the, uh, what does it mean that something is ironic? <clears throat> say one thing, what? <laughs> means something else. That's right. Say one thing, means something else. And so as we take a look at these two poems, we're going to pay attention to, to some degree, the irony that is involved in both of them. Now, in both of these poems, we're also dealing with a kind of loss. So we want to put that in our notes. We're also dealing with a certain kind of loss. We're going to begin, first of all, with the darkling thrush. Now, there's some vocabulary here and some background that will help you to read this poem. One, so you want to write this down. One, this poem was written by Hardy. December the 31st, 1899. Now that you've written that date down, look at it. And then jot down what's significant about that date. Again, write it down so you can see it. December 31, 1899. How about it, Shave? What's significant about that? December 31st. 1899 is what date? What day is that? That's the day right before January 1st. What? 1900. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. What's significant about that? That's right. That's the first day of a new, new century. You got it. Not just a new year, but a new century, right? So in other words... Hardy writes this poem aware that a new century is about to start. An old century is ending. Wait a minute. That's kind of like all of you were alive, weren't you? December 31st, 19... What? 1999, huh? Right? Okay. And some of you can kind of even remember, how old were you guys in 1999? How old were you? Three, four, right? So you were still very, very young. Did any of you remember anything about that, about that evening? Okay, well, I can tell you it was not unlike the hundred years prior. All kinds of excitement, all kinds of anxiety and fear about what was coming. Number two for Hardy. He not only wrote this poem the day before the new century began, he wrote it after a walk he took in late evening. Outside, and for your notes, you want to write this down, he was, he, was in a bad, he was in a bad mood. He was in a bad place. He was full of anxiety about two things. One, the prior century, the, uh, the, the 19th century. It was coming to a close. Two, he was worried about the century to come. What century you would be born in, the 20th century. He's worried about it. Okay? And so he takes this walk. And he's kind of depressed. It's cold outside. Nasty weather, kind of. Gray. Everything about, everything about this walk. Upbeat or downbeat? Positive or negative? Optimistic or pessimistic? Everything about this walk, pessimistic. When? Number three, during his walk in the middle of the winter, in the evening, the night before the new century is to begin, he hears a bird singing. A thrush is a bird. He hears a bird singing. And in the moment that he hears the bird singing, he begins to think that maybe the bird is trying to suggest Something about the future that's not negative, but what? Maybe hopeful. Let's take a look at the poem, and we'll see if we can maybe learn a thing or two about what Hardy is saying here, all right? Read it with me. I'm on 1078, The Darkling Thrush. I lit upon a coppice gate when frost was specter gray and winter's dregs made desolate the wakening eye of day. The tangled vine stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. The land's sharp features seemed to be the century's corpse outland, 
his crypt, the cloudy canopy, the wind, his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunken, hard, and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed favorless as I. At once, a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead in a full-hearted even song of joy eliminated. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, in blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around that I could think there trembled through his happy good night air some blessed hope whereof he knew. And I was unaware. All right, so it's a simple poem. Once you know my background information I shared with you, it's a very simple poem, isn't it? Notice, he begins by telling us he went out for a walk, and everything about his walk is depressing. The gate is breaking down. The clouds are gray. Notice, where are all the people? The last of the first stanza. Where, where'd everybody? Where's everybody? He's looking around for people. Where are they? They're all inside, sitting in front of their fireplace. It's way, way too cold to be outside. He's all alone. The land's sharp feature, second stanza, seem to be the century's corpse out there. In other words, what? He sees, he sees a century like a person. The last day of the century, it's like we're burying the century, right? The 19th century, about to be buried, like burying a person. What is the tone through the first two stanzas? Write it in your notes. What's the tone? How is he dealing with the loss? In this case, it's the loss of what? What is it the loss of? Write it down. What's he dealing with? The loss of time? The loss of what? Keep going. The loss of time? What might you say? The loss of time? Sad because of... Is he happy about the way things went for the last few years of the, of the 19th century? No. No, it's not. It's, it's like everything seems to be going really crummy. And if everything's going crummy now and tomorrow starts a new century, then I'm not going to be very excited about the new century. I'm going to be really bummed about the new century. Things are only going to get worse. Stanza three. At once, a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead in a full-hearted even song of joy eliminated. Then look at the bird he describes. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small. What does gaunt mean? Do you know this word? Gaunt means what? Thin, like you haven't eaten for a long time. So the bird is in, it's in winter, right? Normally, what do we know about birds in winter? Yeah, they usually find some warm spot and head south or whatever, right? Notice this bird has stuck around. Notice that the bird is old. The bird is singing. In blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. In other words, this bird decides to sing in the middle of the gray, in the middle of the depression, in the middle of the sad. This bird starts singing. Last stanza. So little cause for carolings, of such a static sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around. What does he say? The bird has zero reason to be singing. It's cold outside. He's old. He's thin. He's gone. What's this bird so happy about? He asks. He says that I could think there trembled through his happy good night. Air, some blessed, notice the word is capitalized, and you want to put it in your notes, because you're obviously going to quote these lines in the paper that you're writing. What is that word? What is that word that's capitalized? He says, when I heard this bird singing, it made me think there was cause for hope. Define hope real quickly in your annotations. What does that word mean to you? What does the word hope mean to you? How do you want to define that word? Loke, how do you define the word hope? Hope. Optimistic. optimistic? Good, keep going. Roberts, how do you define the word hope? If you hope for things, what does it mean? Uh, uh, 
it's almost like you're expecting something good. You're expecting something good to happen, right? We normally don't hope for bad things. We normally hope what? For something positive, something good. So he says, what does this bird know that I didn't know? It almost made me start rethinking that maybe there was cause to hope, whereof he knew, the bird, and I was unaware. How does he deal with loss by the end of the poem? Jot it down. How does Hardy, or the speaker of the poem, deal with the loss of the old century and the beginning of the new century? How does he deal with loss in the end? Optimistically or pessimistically? How would you say it by the end of the poem? Yeah, he's allowed this bird to maybe give him some reason to hope that things are going to be okay. Things are maybe going to get better in the new century. All right, let's turn now to 1081. And one of the darkly, darkly most satiric poems you will ever read, okay? This is a poem that will require a certain kind of understanding as you read the poem. But you know what? I'm not going to say a lot about this poem. We're just simply going to read it and allow for you to engage in the irony, and you'll want to put that in your notes right away at 2B for this poem, the irony of Hardy. This is probably Hardy's most ironic poem. Some of you will say, when we get finished, this is one of the darkest poems you'll ever read. Let's take a look at it. Ah, are you digging on my grave? I'm on 1081. You should be reading now with me. Ah, are you digging on my grave? Ah, oh, are you digging on my grave, my loved one, planting rue? No. Yesterday he went to wed. One of the brightest wealth has bred. It cannot hurt her now, he said, that I should not be true. Then who is digging on my grave? My nearest, dearest kin? Uh, no. They sit and think, what use? What good will planting flowers produce? No tenderness of her mound can lose her spirit. From death's gen, but someone digs upon my grave, my enemy, plodding sly. Nay, when she heard that you had passed the gate that shuts on all flesh soon or late, she thought you no more worth her hate, and cares not where you lie. Then who is digging on my grave? Say, since I have not guessed. Oh, it is I, my mistress dear, your little dog who still lives near, and much I hope my movements here have not disturbed your rest. Ah, yes, you dig upon my grave. Why flashed it not on me that one true heart was left behind? What feeling do we ever find to equal among humankind a dog's fidelity? Mistress, I dug upon your grave to bury a bone in case I should be hungry near this spot when passing on my daily trot. I am sorry, but I quite forgot it was your resting place. Whoa. Okay, let's exegete here real quickly. Now, for your notes. This is a classic example of a poet saying something without saying. I'll say it again. This is a classic example of a poet saying something without ever saying in other words, something is being said, but nothing is being said. What do you mean? Well, let's kind of figure how it works. Ironically, are you ready for this at 2B? This is a type of dramatic monologue. I say a type because we have a response in this poem, don't we? Right? But the response is going to come from what? A dog. a dog, a puppy, a dog is going to respond at the very end of the poem, right? Now, let's go ahead and take a look at it. Let's make sure you jot down what has happened before this poem starts. What has happened? All right, somebody's died, right? Who is it? Can you deduce from the poem? Any? It's a woman, right, it's a woman. So she's dead, she's under the ground, the mound of dirt over her, right? When all of a sudden, she begins to hear what happening up above. She has some digging's going on. And she immediately imagines, oh, stanza one. Someone is at my graveside planting flowers. And she assumes it's who? Her guy. Oh, my guy. He loved me. 
And so he's planting flowers. Beck shakes his head. No, that's right. The, the response comes, uh, no. Yesterday he went to wed. One of the brightest wealth has bread. It cannot hurt her now, he said, that I should not be true. Ouch. She says, oh, it must be my guy. And the response is what? No, your guy got married yesterday. By the way, did you notice who he got married to? A really rich woman. Right. Somebody, and, and his comment was, what difference does it make? She's already dead. It's not like she's going to know. Digging continues. Oh, look at the second stanza. Who must be digging on my grave? Oh, my family members. My nearest, dearest kin. Oh, that's so nice. They came to plant flowers. Uh, no. A second no. No. They sit and think, uh, what use? What good will planting flowers produce? No tenderance of her mound can lose her spirit from death's gin. She says, oh, it's my family members. They're, they're planting flowers for me. No. Your family members are sitting back home thinking what? What are they? Dude, she's dead. She's under the ground. What difference does it make if we plant flowers? There's no point in planting flowers. What a waste of time. Death's got her. She ain't getting out of the grave. There ain't no point in planting flowers. But digging keeps going. Oh, I know who it is, she says. Someone digs up on my grave. My enemy. Somebody trying to be mean to me. Somebody who I was nasty with. Somebody who I fought with while I was still alive. Shh. My enemy is plotting, planning, sly. No. No, no, no. It's not your enemy either. Look, nay, when your enemy, this woman, heard that you'd pass the gate that shuts on all flesh soon or late, she thought you no more worth her hate. Who cares not where you lie? So notice, first, she figures it's her guy. Nope, he got married yesterday. Two, she figures it's her family members. No, nope, they could care less. They're not planting flowers because they know you're dead. Third, well, it must be my enemy. Even her enemy has, write it in your notes, even her enemy has forgotten. Her lover, her guy, forgot her. Her family members forgot her. Even her enemy has forgotten her. But somebody's digging on the grave. <sighs> Who is it? Of course, now we'll get to the real dark irony of the poem. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the dog. Oh, my dog remembered me. Yes, yes, my dog. Sure, sure, sure. At least my puppy remembered who I am and remembered I'm very here. Oh, isn't that sweet? The dog's, the word here is fidelity. And then the dog finally speaks. Uh, no. Ah, I dug upon your grave to bury a bone in case I should be hungry near the spot when passing on my daily trot. I'm sorry, but I quite forgot it was your resting place. And then notice Hardy just decides to finish the poem Right there. He could have another stanza. And we sometimes played this game of writing another stanza of what she would say when she realizes not even her dog remembers her. Every, right, you're supposedly your best friend. Right, they always say that. Dog is a man's best friend and all of that jazz. Even the dog has completely forgotten. Now, I said before we started this project that this is a poem where the poet says something without saying it. Let's now go to 2A. What does this poem say without saying it? And let's just say it out loud. Whatever this message is, it's probably going to be a dark one, huh? It's probably going to be a dark one. What does this poem say without saying it? It says what? No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter the people in your life, or your dog, or your pets, when you die, what? You, you are quickly forgotten. The dirt on her grave is still soft. And her guy's already gone out and got another girl. Her, her friends, her parents, whatever, 
They're all like, what point does it make putting flowers at her gravesite? She's dead. It's not like she's coming back to know. And even her enemy has forgotten her. And then her dog has forgotten her. puppy dog's forgotten her. She's completely forgotten. And it's only been a few days after her passing. What point is Hardy making, do you think, in a poem like this? What point is he wanting to make about humans in general? Now, there's some of you that won't even want to write this down because it's kind of an unsettling thing to even write these words down. What point is Hardy saying about humans and the way we love people? The way we think about them. What's he saying about people in general? Like I said, some of us don't even like to write this down because it's a little unsettling maybe what he's suggesting about humans in general. What kind of a species are we? Let's say selfish. Yeah, selfish. We'll want to write that word down for sure. We, we love people until what? Until they're gone. And the minute they're gone, notice there's two perspectives in this poem that you, the reader, can take. One, you can imagine yourself one of the other people still alive. You can imagine yourself the loved one left behind. Right? Notice immediately we think back to Remembrance, the poem by Bronte Doe, right? Why should I put flowers out? Really? What's the point of putting flowers out when somebody is dead? I once had a student that said this out loud. You know what? I've never thought about that. But why do we have funerals for dead people? They're already dead. So we like get together and we talk about them as if they're still here. But they're already gone. So what's the point? Why talk about somebody that's not around anymore? This poem says, yeah, that's pretty much the way it is. People have a tendency to quickly forget when other people die. So you can take that perspective and ask simple questions at 3B like the following. Do you have somebody in your life who, if he or she died, you would probably not forget for quite some time? Or are you inclined to say you wouldn't forget, but this poem suggests we forget pretty fast? There's a second way to look at this poem, and it's maybe a little more disturbing. It's the woman in the ground. What about her? What is it that she learns? What did she figure out by the end of this poem? About all the people that she left behind and about the life that she lived. No matter what she had done, she is now completely forgotten. Now that is an interesting observation. It begs a really intriguing question. If you got rear-ended this afternoon and we had to put you under the ground because you were dead, would you be remembered in a year? Can you make a list of the people who you are absolutely certain would come to your funeral or come to your graveside a year or two after your passing? That you could say, well, I know absolutely this person would. I know absolutely this person would. There isn't any doubt that this person. And for those of us who go, yeah, this poem makes me begin to wonder. Now, is this poem a truthful representation of the way people mourn loss, do you think? Do you think it's true that people are so quickly and easily forgotten? Or rather, does this say something about the woman who got buried in the grave? Do you hear my question, Mr. Bryant? In other words, if this is a woman who didn't live a very good life, then it explains why A, her guy would bolt, B, her family would go, whatever, C, her enemy would even say, I don't really care too much, and even her dog would be like, yeah, seriously, I totally forgot you were there. Does it have something to do more about the woman in the ground? Do you get me? Does it say something about the kind of life she must have lived? Notice, I told you, this poem says a lot without saying it. It might say something about who and what she was. If, for example, right now you report, I don't know that I have three people in my life who five years after my death, if I were to die tonight, that would still come to my graveside and mourn me. That may say less about the people you associate with and more about you. 
Do you, do you got me? Do you understand what Hardy's saying here? In other words, if you have not lived a life where you've developed close relationships with people, whose fault is that? Of course, there's another interesting question. Do you want to be remembered after you're gone? Or would you prefer to, prefer to be forgotten? What about the woman here? Do you think she cares that even the dog didn't recognize her? How do you know she cares? She was so excited when, oh, it's my dog. Yes, somebody remember. No. Dog says no. Mm -mm. Sorry about that. All right, now to 1084. On 1084, you've got your question there. You're writing your comparative analyses. You're going to now look at the ways in which loss is dealt with, okay, either successfully or in some sense of failure, okay? So 